Well, I do want to talk a little bit more about the book, but uh, first let's talk about your Fab Forum podcast. It's a weekly program featuring yourself and three other Beatle expert tech experts pontificating about all things Beatle related. I know you're not just four off the street Beatle fans, so why don't you tell us a little about each of your co hosts and their credentials? Sure. Um, the other three are Tony Troguardo, who is a uh, Beatles historian. Uh, he also is, um, he actually is a librarian, uh, so he's very knowledgeable on all things, uh, on how to acquire all things in history. Uh, but he is also a uh, trustee on the Long Island Music Hall of Fame board uh, here, which we have very, uh, very astute people. We have you know people like Simon and Garfunkel are inducted, and Billy Joel and Neil Diamond. So he's he's a trustee on that. Um, he also has a couple of uh, has had Beatles shows in the past on radio, and now has uh, a non beatles show. But um, he's one of the co-hosts. We have Rob Leonard, who has been doing Beatles songs on uh, uh, local radio here and on the internet now uh, for 25, 30 years. Um, it, it is called Beatles Songs, and, it, and it's one of the only live Beatles shows still around. And uh, Ken Michaels has also done a lot of Beatles shows. He has a, a he had a show on, and it just came back, thank goodness, called Every Little Thing. But he's been on major stations in New York and New Jersey, and he was on Sirius uh, with Beatles shows, uh, a major uh, Beatles fan as well. So mm-hmm. all of them have been uh, in radio um Doing, you know, again, Beatle history. Uh, I'm an author. Uh, I'm actually going to be on radio, uh, uh, resurrecting a show with Tony called Beatle Tracks. That'll be on in the next month or so. Hmm. So uh, all pretty much, uh, you know, I call, I affectionately call ourselves Beatle geeks, but um, you know, we are. And but you know, hopefully, we know our stuff. But you know what, uh, myself, myself, and most people who listen to the show. We've all been participants in conversations that are virtually identical to a typical Fab Form episode, you know. Yeah, and that's what that, I mean, that's, that's great. That's what we wanted. Mm-hmm. You know, we wanted people, we wanted to talk about, obviously, give our knowledge. And we, and we do have facts. You know, we do research. We don't just get on there and babble. No. We do babble, but, but we do a lot of research. If you saw the studio when we prepare, I mean, each one of us comes in with, you know, a bunch of sheets of paper. You know, we always kid that, except Rob. You know, he always does it off the top of his head, but and that's just a joke because he's mm-hmm. very well versed as well. But um, you know, we we make it where we, we're average, four average guys who are talking about the Beatles, and we don't play music, and that's actually pretty unique in itself. Uh, we started out with a half hour talk show, and then we we've been bumping it up to the point where. We have an episode that we just released this week on the McCartney solo debut and the reissue, and it's it's an hour and a half, over an hour and a half. Uh, but we felt it was justified. You know, we, we're not uh, stru- we're not held back or confined to a certain structure. Yeah. So me either. And it's and it is. It's it's like four of us. Just you know, if you guys are listening on the radio, people are fans and listeners, um, fellow Beatle lovers. If they're listening, they you know we hear all the time. Oh, I wish I would have just. And on with you guys because I had something to say, or mm-hmm. or I hated what you said. I was on <laughs> the computer, or which is fine. I mean, we want to elicit a response, and and the uniqueness of not playing music. We've gotten some great feedback where we've actually heard where people say, you know, I don't want to hear the music because you guys talk about it in such depth mm-hmm. that I can pick, I can hear the music in my head, and then after the show, I'll go put it on, which is also nice. So you know, it's it's been a very fulfilling experience for the past year and a half. Well, that's what I do. If you talk about Ram or something, I'll, I'll listen to the show, then I'll go listen to Ram right after. Right, and you may hear it in a different light if, if maybe one of us said something that, mm-hmm. you know, is an epiphany. Who knows? I mean, you know, and I'm not saying we're going to, you know, be an epiphany every week. No, no, well, you know, in my mind, the basic premise of the show is to gain new insight into old facts and put the Beatles' legacy into perspective. I mean, right. am I reading that right? Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, not that I mean, obviously we we'd love to be four pipe pipers who carry on the Beatles' legacy, mm-hmm. uh, you know, for for young fans, and and that's great. If we do that, that's perfect. We we do get a lot of email from young people who say, look, I just started listening to the Beatles in 1990, mm-hmm. 1995, or even 2000, and it's great to hear what you guys are saying because I didn't know any of it. 
Right. And there are some people who say we get our facts wrong, and and we do. We're we're not you know we're not infallible. Um, so it's nice that people are listening. Put it that way. I mean, it doesn't matter if you know sometimes they hate us, sometimes they love us, and sometimes they're just in the middle. Mm-hmm. But it's nice that we actually have listeners. Well, you know, how many other bands that broke up 40 years ago could you, you know, sustain a show based on that, you know, you could put out every week? You know, you guys come up with, a, which is a tribute to the Beatles, you guys come up with a lot of interesting angles, you know. Sometimes the, the premise itself is really pretty brilliant. You guys also include their solo work under your umbrella, which greatly expands the possibilities, particularly considering the two of them are still releasing new material to this day. Uh, am I remembering it right that you premiered the show around September 2009 when all the remasters were coming out? We did. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't conscious. We actually talked about um, starting the show in May of 2009, and we didn't come out with remaster shows uh, until months later. And, we, you know, we, we did so much on the remasters that we actually had to have two parters for each uh, stereo and mono, and those got great response. But we, at that point, we weren't established yet, so we had to wait until the remasters came out. We didn't get any advanced copies, mm-hmm. uh, so we didn't come out with them until later. But yes, we did premiere in September, uh, and the, it's very—I mean, it is a very big tribute to the Beatles that we can still be talking about them. But you know, I, I'm going to be a little cocky here and say that you know we do. We I will say we come up with some pretty good angles like you said and it's and it is tough be, and we have to include the solo years because there's only so much you can talk about the Beatles as a group and the Beatles solo years are so important uh, you know the Beatles solo have been around a lot longer than the Beatles oh, yeah. as a group so you in, and there's such uh, significant works in each one of their canons musically and non-musically as well mm-hmm. so you know it's great to be talking about the solo Beatles as well but it's tough to come up with sometimes we have our conference calls and we'll, you know, say, what's what's the angle this week? And, you know, we just did a, a nice uh, episode on uh, Bob Dylan and the Beatle Connections. Mm-hmm. You know, we've done Monkey and Beatle Connections. We do, you know, we've done stuff like, you know, George, Cry for a Shadow. Was George in the shadow of the other two? Mm-hmm. So we try to come up with an angle, not just, you know, we're going to review a hard day's night, the album. Or you just say, let's just take a year like 1973. What did all the Beatles do that year? And you realize yeah, they all did done. great things. Those uh, episodes of the years that we've done, we did 1967, The Good, Bad, and the Ugly, and we did uh, 1973. We'd, and those year shows really uh, you know, are very, very popular with the listeners. Well, you know, with a group of four, there's often like a weak link or two, but you guys have a really good chemistry. You all make valid points. You all contribute more or less equally. Um, what I like is the occasional moments of revelation when one of you makes a particularly good point. The moment of revelation that sticks out to me was when you guys were talking about the movie Help, specifically the merits of it. You know, was it as good as Hard Day's Night? Well, maybe not. Here were some of the problems with it, blah, blah, blah. And then Rob kind of pointed out that probably the most significant thing about the movie wasn't the movie at all. It was the fact that George Harrison discovered the sitar on yes. the set of the movie. That yeah. actually had all three of us. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, and and we, we laugh. We say that Rob... It's so quiet because Rob's the engineer in the studio while we do it. He's behind the glass, so to speak, unless we're in the air studio, which we're all four together. Mm-hmm. So it's usually Tony, Ken, and myself, and then Rob behind the glass. And at that point, we were all together. And when he said that, you know, we had all extensive notes on help and the deleted scenes, and we thought we were all great, you know, and mm-hmm. we had all these things. And then we always say that Rob is quiet, but when he does speak, he comes out with something revelatory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I revelatory. felt the same way about him. You hear a little less from him, but it's always good stuff. Exactly. And you know what? That was perfect. That sitar, it made the episode. It was at the end, and it just pulled it all together and said, you know what? That was really cool because, you know, anybody could go and look at the deleted scenes, but something like what Rob said is something that you have to really think out. And he did it, and bravo to him. I mean, that's that's yeah. a credit to Rob. And, and at, at some points we all do it, but, uh, you know, that was, you're right, that was a perfect example. We all three of us just went, really? <laughs> that's great. We didn't think about that. So it's fun when that happens because yeah. we all sit there and, you know, it, it makes us, because, again, we don't know everything. We're not claiming to know everything. I know that you're a drummer, you're a musician. Are yep. the other three musicians too? They play some guitar, mm-hmm. you know, uh, well, let me let me put it this way. You've been in bands before. How many yeah. of the other three have been in bands? Uh, Tony has been in bands. Tony's been in bands uh, singing. 
Uh, I also uh, have sung and uh, and play drums, and mm -hmm. uh, I do write music. I have written many, many songs and played and and uh, sung and produced uh, on my own. I play all the instruments, so I play more than just the drums. But uh, it's nice also being a musician because then you can relate to the Beatles and that. That's right. Well, well, I do. I mean, I, I remember one of the brilliant things about their music is you can be a beginning musician, and you can pull off things like "Get Back," for example. You please an audience. It's not too many chords, and and you know it's uh it's great music to learn to play an instrument on and and sound good while you're doing it. Absolutely, but you know the one thing I have to give Ringo credit for not only because I'm a drummer, because but because he he was brilliant. You know, most people always say, "Oh, Ringo was lucky," and um. Ringo is a lefty, and, and I can't believe that some people don't even know that he was a lefty. But when he comes off the drums on a fill, when he comes off a fill, and, and drummers will know what I mean, he used, starts with his left hand where a righty starts with their right hand. He gets an extra beat in there. Hmm. And a lot of the songs are very hard to replicate because yeah. of that extra beat, unless you can try to get that down. It's very tough, and, and i got to tell you, Ringo's a lot better than most people give him credit for. Yeah, well, since you brought that topic up, let's talk a little bit about whether or not all Beatles are created equally. Because even in the Beatle cartoon series, uh, John and Paul were distinguished from George and Ringo by their clothing. John and Paul were dressed the same, and George and Ringo were dressed the same, but they were slightly different from each other. Right. You know, so even the animators had put them sort of into two camps. And then, you know, here's the irony. Ringo, who's considered the best actor in the band, based on his performance in Hard Day's Night, in the cartoon, he becomes a buffoon, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and you know what? I'm not sure if they did the clothing um, on purpose in, mm -hmm. in to team them up that way, because, again, I don't think they really knew. Right. Uh, because the characterizations were done by Peter Sander, who was 19 at the time. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that was done on purpose. It might have, you know, who knows? Maybe it would have been done differently, like you know, Paul and Ringo, because of one one voice, different, you know, different voices. But um, I, I, you know, I, I think I think we can look back now and say, you know, they made John and Paul the same, and you know. Mm -hmm. It's easy in retrospect to say things like that, but it probably was just a coincidence. What I'm hearing you saying is that in your mind, all four Beatles are created equal. Oh, absolutely. You've got to have George, you've got to have Ringo. Um, author Mark Lewison, who has reportedly listened to more Beatle music than anyone else on the planet, apart from the band itself probably, is a big Ringo defender. After listening to hours and hours of Beatle recording sessions, he said that not only is there no evidence from studio logs, which is basic common logistical sense, that Ringo's drumming was ever wiped and replaced, as some have suggested, but in fact, Ringo made far fewer mistakes than the other three Beatles. The drumming errors were rare, so I think it's a little sad and unfair that his drumming is criticized and under suspicion. I mean, there are a few cases where it's known that Paul did play the drums back in the USSR, Dear Prudence, Ballad of John and Yoko, because J Ringo simply wasn't there to do it. Right. And you think that um, that led to rumors about Ringo possibly not playing on other tracks? No, because there were there were rumors way earlier that uh, Bernard Purdy, Bernard Purdy yeah. you know, was playing on the drums. Uh, I mean, you know, it all started with Love Me Do. I mean, it's a big misunderstanding. You know, yeah. Ringo doesn't play on one version because, not because George Martin didn't want him to. The Beatles didn't tell them, didn't tell George Martin that there was going to be a new drummer. So he showed up and, and George Martin had no idea who he was and he didn't even know he was going to be there. So he sat him down for, you know, one of the versions. So, uh, you know, it, and now it always came out that, you know, George Martin didn't like Ringo's playing at that <laughs> point or didn't. You know, that's all hogwash. And, and George Martin just came out and said it uh, about three days ago when he was at the Love Fifth Anniversary Celebration. So, you know, there there were rumors way back when, but it's mm -hmm. all unwarranted. Ringo was a, a really fine drummer. Well, how do you feel about Ringo as a writer? Don't pass me by Octopus's Garden. Uh, we can go on to the next question. Because I, I, my feeling is, yeah, yeah, as a writer, if those two songs were removed, it might not make much of a dent. But as a lead vocalist on the Lennon and McCartney songs were written for him, or you know some of the background vocals he did where he's real prominent and carry that weight. Uh, I think his his uh, singing voice is a very important element. When I listen to old Beatles, I love to hear him sing. And of um, you know of course his drumming on A Day in the Life and Come Together and you know come on give the guy he's he's a, a full Beatle. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Listen, if not even musically, the Beatles personalities needed to have all four of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, all four of them were the Beatles because of their distinct personalities. All four of them needed each other. 
I, I just don't think that Paul and John would have, could have continued. Not that they, uh, not that they couldn't have, but it wouldn't have been the Beatles if they ever replaced George or Ringo and, and or either one of them. I just well, put it this way: they had a chance. They had Pete Best, and it didn't fly. So well, not only that, they had a chance when George left you know, a couple of times, Ringo mm-hmm. left a couple of times, but mm-hmm. they, you know, they went after both of them. Mm-hmm. Why did they do that? Out of guilt? No, because they knew <laughs> that you know right. they were the Beatles. You know, there's a lot of bands, uh, I don't know, Deep Purple, Kansas, even Aerosmith, where original members leave and they try and carry on. But until the original members come back and it's the classic lineup, they always, you know, flounder. Right. Um, Well, you know, speaking of George and a little defense of him, many people, myself included, are of the opinion that in the final phase of the band, George was writing the strongest material. Absolutely. You know, something, Here Comes the Sun, and the All Things Must Pass album immediately after the Beatles. He was definitely a great songwriter. Oh, yeah, I think he definitely grew. Uh, you know, personally, I I think, and we've said it in um, other shows, that I think that in Fab Forum shows, I, I really believe that if they would have released Don't Bother Me as a single in 64, mm-hmm. it would have been a great hit single as well. Um, because of the freshness of it, it sounds great. I know George dismissed it, and he also dismissed songs like You Like Me Too Much. But, uh, you know, as he grew, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, he was doing he was doing better than, you know, the others. Yeah. Something is brilliant. Uh, a lot of the, and then after that, the solo career, I mean, he proved himself. I mean, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, he might have started out a little rough, but he was, what, 18, 19? Give me a break. Well, that's the thing. I mean, politically, he suffered from being the youngest member of the band. And, you know, if, even if it's a year or two, you're going to sort of suffer in the inner band politics if you're the, the kid, so to speak. Absolutely. But, you know, let's um, tie it into the cartoon, because in the cartoon, you know, they depicted John as the leader, Paul as his eager lieutenant, Ringo as the comedic foil. But George was the least defined in terms of his actions and attitudes, almost as if the writers didn't have a handle on him or his role in the band. Do you think there's a parallel to real life with that? Well, I know there was. Um, what, what the writers told me was that they used it. They, all they had to do in the beginning was, uh, all they had to use in the beginning to know who the Beatles were was A Hard Day's Night and some live footage. Yeah. Now, later on, they got help. So, I mean, when the public quickly uh, described George Harrison as the quiet one, hmm. well, they had to do that. I mean, they just didn't know anything else. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that went along with just what, you know, what the public personas of each one of them were. So don't let anybody tell you that they were any lesser Beatles than than they were. Well, amen to that. Well, let's bring it back to uh, Fab Forum. Um, You do a lot of discussions among the four of you, but you also have episodes where you have a guest. You've had um, a lot of impressive past guests, including two actual Beatles. You had Pete Best on the show, and even the man himself, Ringo Starr. You've had uh, major players like in the Beatles story like Billy J. Kramer and Peter Asher. Um, who is your personal favorite guest that you've had so far? Wow. Uh, I mean, that's that's a tough one. I mean, I, I mean, of course I'm going to say Ringo Starr. Mm-hmm. I mean, we we got to interview Ringo we then established a relationship where you know his people and he trusted us enough to uh do the radio special that we did for his why not album and uh summer tour of 2010 uh the the wildest part being a beatle fan and especially a drummer and the wildest part is you know we we sent him a zoom recorder which for those of you who don't know what that is it's a, it's a handheld <laughs> recorder that a lot of reporters use when they do you know press conferences we sent him one with a you know a media card in it, and you know sent him some things to say like hi this is Ringo and you're listening to the why not All Star Special whatever, mm-hmm. and he did about twelve fifteen minutes on there and a lot of stuff he ad libbed, and one day my wife called me and said you know you got a package from Ringo Starr, nice. and you know there it was and, and as soon as I put it in the computer you know just hearing him say hi guys here we go and mm-hmm. uh, that was the most exciting thing in my life. Don't get me wrong. I'm talking music-wise. Right, right. right. The birth of my kids, my right, wife, of course. You know, all that, my, my wedding. I mean, all that is is much more important in the scheme of things. Well, I want to bring it back uh, to a guest we had in common, which was Chris O'Dell. She's been on your show and my show. Uh, she's the one who recommended the Electric Light Orchestra to George after she worked with him as a tour manager. And she didn't think she was going to really like him, and then she heard them play hit after hit and thought, you know, these guys are good. Now, this was when George was purposely avoiding listening to the radio as a result of the My Sweet Lord fiasco. He didn't want to suffer the embarrassment of any more uh, further subconscious plagiarism, you know, right. so he wouldn't listen to any music. Uh, so she was the catalyst for 
the Jeff Lynn connection that ultimately led to the Traveling Wilburys and Jeff Lynn's production of the Free as a Bird and Real Love Sessions. And I wanted to ask you what you think of those recordings, both in terms of whether or not they should have done it, which some people debate, and also the quality of the songs themselves. Ooh, that's a tough one. I mean, we actually had a whole episode on Fab Forum about whether we thought they were real Beatles songs, so to speak, mm-hmm. uh, and should be considered so in their in their canon with everything else. Um, I mean, I- I'm glad they did them. I- um, I'm I- I'm sure they did technically the best they could for 1994 mm-hmm. uh, when they first started getting back with the tape of John's. Yep. I I personally don't mind them at all. Uh, I don't love them, but I, I don't turn them off if I hear them. They're totally different songs, too. One is more of a pop hit in Real Love. One is more of a sort of a, a dirtier sort of feel with Free as a Bird. Um, I, I, I like the recordings. I love the fact that the harmonies are just there, just mm-hmm. like the Beatles harmonies. Uh, I, I'm a big harmony guy, and both songs just had great harmonies. I, I'm, I wish they wouldn't have sped up John's voice for real love because there are versions out there where it's normal yeah. uh, speed and it sounds a lot better. Also, most people don't know that Paul double tracked in a very high falsetto with John on mm. real love. Yeah. So you and you could hear it some places, but I think that also adds to the sort of the Alvin and the Chipmunk aspect of it. Yeah. Um, I wish they wouldn't have done that because the song is a really great song. And I, I, I do like both of them. I mean, they are Beatles songs. Uh, yeah. Funny enough, I was in London in 1996 uh, going to Apple when they released uh, Real Love. And it was wild because, I, you know, in Piccadilly they had the, the video and they were playing it nonstop all over the... You could hear it outside of all the shops, which was, mm-hmm. was pretty rare. So, that yeah. you know, that one stuck in my head because of that. But... Um, I, I also wish they wouldn't have made Free as a Bird sound like John is singing through a tin can. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm sure there's techno- technologically better ways of doing it. Uh, maybe not at the time, but <laughs> you know, in hindsight, that, that's all hindsight. But I, I enjoy the both songs. You know, I agree that the poor sound quality of John's lead vocals did detract a bit from the effectiveness of the tracks. I thought both songs themselves were, you know, worthy of being, you know, Beatles songs. But see, there's another element that had nothing to do with the music that I really enjoyed, which was the excitement of being able to hear something new from the Beatles, because it goes back to our ages, you know. Um, right. When you're watching the anthology, the new Beatles song in four minutes, you know nobody's heard it except maybe a handful of people, and you're going to experience something, whether good, bad, or ugly, and you felt that excitement. That must be the excitement people felt when they heard that uh, the paperback writer single was in the stores, or you know, you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. You know, because it, when you're watching the anthology, I mean, if you remember, they they actually had a countdown. Yeah, that's you know, what I mean. Yeah. Thirty to the new Beatles song. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it it was just as fresh as when I. You know, went into the store and pulled out a, a new 45 out of the slots, you know, mm-hmm. um, and saw the picture sleeve. And, uh, and so, yes, in a, in a way, I agree with you on that freshness, that excitement. But knowing what we knew that it was John, you know, posthumously, yeah, it, it, it I don't know, it sort of took a little bit away from it, but I, I, I enjoy both of them. One last thing about Free as a Bird, the video was pretty spectacular. I think that, I thought anyway, that it demonstrated that Beatle magic that always kept them ahead of everybody else, even in the 90s. The one thing I, I'm, I'm sorry about is that the Internet wasn't more prevalent because the Beatles themselves could have had a contest to see, you know, all of the uh, bits and pieces where they're from. Now on the Internet there are many sites that have, you know, all of the little where you know what what each piece means i think the beatles themselves could have done something really cool with that but the video was brilliant well let's do something uh for fun if you like you mentioned the beatles could have used the internet to uh you know quiz their fans i actually have some some quiz questions to test your knowledge if you want to take a shot at it i'll take a shot but if i do poorly don't tell the other three guys okay well it should be pretty easy for an expert like yourself oh well, here we go i'll start with this we all know that ringo inadvertently titled a hard day's night and Tomorrow Never Knows. Yep. Um, another Beatle drummer also inadvertently provided a song title, uh, Name the Drummer and the Song. Another Beatle drummer. And I've got some hints if you need them. Oh, I definitely need a hint. Okay, it wasn't Pete Best, and it wasn't professional drummer Andy White. Or one of the other three Beatles. 
Oh, I was going to go there. Mm-hmm. Another Beatle drummer. I'm trying to think of other Beatle drummers. Uh, Andy White, Tommy Moore. Uh, think uh, throat surgery. Oh, Jimmy Nickel. Uh huh. That's the drummer. What was the song? Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, I do know this one. They'd always ask him, "Hey, Jimmy, how are things going for you?" Oh, uh, give me the answer. He'd always say, "Getting better. It's getting better." Uh, yeah, how's it working out with the band, Jimmy? Well, it's getting better. He'd always say, "It's getting better." That's all he ever said. And guess and, what? It got worse for him. <laughs> <laughs> it got worse. For him. <laughs> Paul made a note of it. Hmm, getting better. I exactly. might do something. Jimmy, might do something with that later. <laughs> Thank you, but I'll take that title. Okay, well, um, okay, well, here's another question. Um, oh, for one. I don't worry, we're not keeping score. The first time the Beatles ever worked with George Martin and were essentially strangers to each other, uh, he gave them a lecture about studio procedure, and then he asked if any of them had anything to say, to which George responded, which of these three choices? A, I don't like your tie. B, don't bother me. Or C, I notice we have the same first name. Would you mind changing yours? Very good, but I'm going to have to say the answer is A. I don't. A ding, ding, ding. It's I don't like your tie. You know, that's there's there's your quiet beetle. He's the only one who spoke up, and he said something irreverent, which apparently George Martin thought was really funny. Yes, and it broke the ice. <laughs> broke the ice. So there's your there's your equal beetle right there. I think that's more than equal beetle right there. Yeah, he's the one who stepped up. Yep. Okay, well, here's a question. In the lyrics of Lady Madonna, Paul mentions six of the seven days of the week. What is the one day of the week that he doesn't mention? He does not mention Saturday. That's right. And why do you think that is? Because it didn't rhyme with anything. <laughs> it's, it was, oh, it's almost right. I mean, Friday night arrives without a suitcase. I know, but too many syllables. It's too many syllables. That's right. All the other weekdays have two syllables, but Saturday has three, and it didn't fit the song. Exactly. There you go. Well, now we'll keep score. You're two for three. <laughs> In baseball, that's good. Well, you'll get this one right, too. Oh. Um, during the fade-out of Strawberry Fields Forever, John delivers the following cryptic message. A. I buried Paul. B. Library card. A C. Raspberry gloss. Or D. Cranberry sauce. Wow. See, that's that's an easy one, but a hard one because obviously the answer is D. Cranberry sauce. But as we all know, it's always been misheard as I buried Paul. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit of a trick question there. I was trying to make a joke about Diana Ross, too. You know, <laughs> raspberry cranberry sauce, I'm Diana Ross, but I couldn't make it work. <laughs> okay, well, we're on the topic of food. It's become fairly well known that Paul's temporary lyrics for his classic song, Yesterday, was scrambled eggs. So this one's true or false. True or false, scrambled eggs was only one component of a song cycle he had written encompassing a complete nutritious breakfast, which also included... Got to get juice into my life. She's leaving scones and Lucy in the sky with waffles. <laughs> That's very funny, but it's false. I think we can all assume it's false, although, like you say, we'll never really know, but I think it's well, false. Well, hey, you know, if you go to Sgt. <laughs> Pepper, Good Morning, Good Morning was inspired by the Corn Flakes commercial. Uh, good point, good point. There's another food thing. And on and on on Sesame Street, they did parody Hey Jude as Hey Food. <laughs> There you go. That's that one. Wasn't too far off track after all. Exactly. Okay, well, I just have one last one for you, which is this. Name three songs that the Beatles recorded in German. And you want me to give you those? Mm, three of them. Most people know two of them. Okay. Sie lieb dich. Yep. Kam gib mir deine Hand. Yep. And I don't know if most people are going to know this one. But it's actually get back. It's actually get rouse. Well, before I let you go, uh, I want to talk a little bit about just the general circumstances that led you to become an author. I suspect that the notion of writing a book crosses just about everyone's mind at one time or another, but you know, most of us don't follow through because we assume we could never pull it off due to factors beyond our control. So what were the circumstances that enabled you to write the Beatletunes book? Well, you know, a couple of things happened. I, I had always been 
a lover of writing, uh, whether it was music, lyrics, poems, stories. That was my outlet for a lot of emotions to come out. Uh, you know, I went through my mom and dad were divorced, so there was a lot of things that I needed to get out, and writing was always my way of doing that. Um, and the Beatles were my connection since the age of two, from you know 1964, literally the age of two. Um, so I wanted to. I, I had this knowledge of Beatles stuff, and I said, you know what? Let me try to write something about the Beatles. And then I thought, what subject would I write about? And there's thousands, literally thousands of books on the Beatles. And I said, you know, if I just write another biography or attempt to do something like that, it's going to get lost in the shuffle. I said, let me figure out some niche that I could call my own in terms of the Beatles' history. And I, you know, I had, I had loved the cartoons, and I just said, you know what, no one has ever written about it. I don't know anything about it. It would be great if I can try to find out things about it and then put it in book form. For all I knew, it could have been a pamphlet, because I didn't know if I'd find out anything. And after I did compile quite, you know, an extensive uh, bit of research, um, you know, I decided, let me, let me try to make this into a book. And did you uh, approach a publisher and say, I have this idea for this book, I've accumulated this so far? What, well, know? I did. I approached many, many publishers. And, you know, the, the, the good thing about this is that the name The Beatles goes very far. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I approached publishers back in, ooh, 95 and 6 uh, with a whole lot of stuff that I had gathered by then. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody was loving it, but then uh, there were a lot of publishers, uh, big, big houses, where they wanted it initially, and then when they saw the... the, the my, my biggest advantage was also my biggest downfall, because it was a niche that nobody had written about, but then again, the cartoons were never released, they weren't on the air, and, they, and a lot of the big houses thought it would not sell well, because nobody would really want to read about one little tiny piece of the Beatles history. And so I got discouraged. Uh, I had a bunch of smaller houses that said yes, and then things happened where other, you know, one house uh, said yes, and then Mother Teresa passed away. So there were many books on Mother Teresa, so mine got pushed out. Hmm. Uh, so a lot of circumstances happened, and then, you know, the publisher that took it uh, was a small rock and roll publisher and, and loved it and said, let's go with it. So, you know, that's how it happened. And I say never underestimate the public's interest in any aspect of the Beatles, especially that, I mean, you're talking about a 52 share, and not yeah, that long ago. That's not like you're writing something about George's guitar strings. I mean, this has some real history to it. And people have written about George's guitar strings. <laughs> I mean, literally. Right. Um, but you know what? The, the, but I, I will have to agree with them on one thing. You know, they didn't know that the Beatles cartoons had done so well. I mean, they really, they, they weren't reading all of my research. Here's your mistake. You should have written a book about the Beagles. <laughs> <laughs> yes, dog lovers would have loved it. <laughs> well, I know that uh, during the research phase of your book, you were able to reconnect a lot of people who worked on the series who lost track of each other and rekindle some old friendships. How gratifying was that for you personally? Oh, it was amazing, and it still to this day is. Um, you know, a lot of people who had not talked to each other in 30 years, uh, and then others from studios, different studios like Canada and U.K., uh, you know, there were people who moved from the UK to Canada, uh, really ironically, uh, coincidentally, and they connected with the people in the UK again, and it was just so nice that uh, you know I was able to facilitate that. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not talking cocky here; I'm just no, you were the catalyst. Otherwise. It was it was so nice that you know I was able to bring together so many people, and also give a lot of people credit for something that they were never given credit for. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the people that I interview have, have since passed on. And, you know, a lot of their families have told me that, you know, some of the best things that happened to them were at the end of their life when you gave them, you know, the opportunity to talk about something that they did and then see it in print. So I'm very proud of that fact. I really am. Yeah, a little recognition well-deserved for them. It's a for them, imp absolutely. important piece yeah. of, of uh, history and, you know, Beatle history and just American history, I think. Yes, you know, and, and they, a lot of the people I found, you know, that worked on the Beatles, went, you know, prior or after worked on some major, major shows. Yeah. Uh, so you know, they really were a lot more, you know, historical uh, than 
than anybody knew, and you know nobody ever got to tell their story uh, yeah. until you know I came out with this, and then some you know some people really got well known, which is nice. And and you know one of the animators is has credited me now because he now does shows you know where he just sells his Beatle cartoon artwork. That's great too. Mm-hmm. I mean, created another, a career for him. Exactly, another another form of a career. You know, even in later in life. Well, it's awesome, and I enjoyed, um, re- even if you're not a Beatles fan, I think it's interesting to read, and if you are a Beatles fan, obviously, you know, it's kind of like a must-read. Uh, let me uh, ask you this hypothetical question. If you were guaranteed the time and the funding right now to write any book of your choice, what would the topic be? Ooh. That's really interesting. That's an, I, I, I don't think I can answer that. <clears throat> I mean, I'd have to really think about that. I mean, um, in the interim, I did write a children's book uh, called Little Billy and Baseball Bob, which has sold out, uh, and um, which was very gratifying. That was a, a, a story about a little boy who idolizes a baseball player and finds out that his father should be his real hero. Mm. Um, and in light of two, you know, 9-11, um, and I used to work at the Trade Center, so mm. uh, believe me, I know... In light of 9/11, you know, we needed a little bit of hero worship, and it really should have been, you know, parents. Um, and that book was something that I had floating out there for a while. And because of the Beatle book, that got published uh, and did really, really well. But as far as the book right now, I mean, I always wanted to continue my Little Billy series to not to preach to people, but to teach people. Because little Billy can meet a handicapped person, little Billy can meet a girl for the first time, mm-hmm. and maybe you know have little Billy be the catalyst to uh, to teach young children, you know, uh, about stuff that they may not be reading right now. Well, I have uh, two boys ready to turn four and one, so that's a book I'd, I'll I'll check out for sure. Oh, absolutely! I'll I'll you know I'll send you one. You hook me up. Hey, that's cool. Well, speaking absolutely. of getting hooked up with Mitch Axelrod books, let's mention that Beetle Tunes, and that's spelled. T-O-O-N-S, like cartoons, not like iTunes. Beetle Tunes, the real story behind the cartoon Beatles. It's still in print. It's available at many outlets, including Amazon.com. And, you know, for those of you who might be thinking, well, you know, why do I need the book? You just told me the whole story. Well, here's the thing. We didn't tell you the whole story. There are many interesting and relevant subplots we didn't go into, which I'm sure you'll find entertaining. And even more importantly, the book is full of vintage artwork, original character modeling sheets, diagrams, photos of related merchandise, uh, the rare memos I mentioned from the networks and the studios. And, you know, the visual documentation is is very impressive, telegrams, drawings. I mean, you know, uh, there's an index in the back that has a summary of all the episode plots and the original air dates and, you know. Some of the errors that are in the The errors, right, that you pointed out. I mean, the podcast is is fine, but you really, you got to read the book. Is it available in the... Kindle form, that's the new thing, right? Kindle form. Yeah, it's not. As, mm-hmm. uh, only because there's so many pictures, and, and I, yeah. you know, Kindle doesn't allow. Uh, and, and also, you, you know, if, no matter how big the reader is, uh, you never get that, just like a CD in an album. When, when Sgt. Pepper came out on CD, it was different than holding the gatefold album. Well, same thing with Kindle. I mean, you wouldn't mm-hmm. feel the effect if you, if you had a, a small reader and you're reading it. Yeah, you needed a magnifying glass on Pepper to have any idea yeah, what it even exactly. was. Yeah. Um, Well, let's also mention, of course, in addition to the book, to check out Mitch on Fab Forum Podcast. You've done, what, about 80 shows now? Uh, We are. We just published our 83rd, yeah. They're very breezy. You know, it's it's not work to listen to them. I listen to them when I drive. And, you know, if you're going to make a purchase, you guys have a lot of advice about purchases, you know, things that you mentioned that Beatle books and things that people may not even know exist. So, you know, it's educational in that sense. But I just listen to it for the entertainment. Well, thank you. And and we should tell people that it's, you know, fab and F O U R U M. Right. Uh, so people don't think it's F O R U M because people have written to me saying I I can't get to you because, and I see mm-hmm. you left out the U because there's there's four of us and it's a forum of people so <laughs> and the Fab Four so it all works. So it's F-O-U-R-U-M. much like the Beatles who took the insect and changed the spelling. <laughs> You've taken the forum and changed the spelling to be clever, and it's worked against you now. So it's uh, www.fabfourum dot com. That's a good starting point. They're on iTunes. They're on Podorama. Um, they are around. Well, this podcast was recorded at Mojo Recording Studio in Phoenix, Arizona. It was engineered, as always, by Mike Post. I want to thank Mitch Axelrod for being my guest today. It was a pleasure to talk to you. I appreciate you calling in. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It really was fun. Now comes 
the part of the show where all you boys and girls get a chance to test your vocal cords. We call this the sing-along. All you kids out there will now have a chance to sing this next song right along with us. Prop man! Oh, prop man! Yes, Paul? Not you, Ringo, the prop man. Ain't you heard? I'm taking his place today. All right, then. This first number is a tender, romantic love song. Love song, you say? Mm. Uh, I've got just the thing. Now, kids, while Ringo is... You! Paul! How's this? Who in blazes are you supposed to be? Cupid, of course. Romantic, ain't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you say you're Cupid or stupid? Cupid with a K. Oh. Same, kids. <laughs> Thank you. 